Hey everybody, welcome back to another reaction video. We have a crazy one today. Today we are talking about a social worker who is 32 years old, as old as I am, and she was faking and she was pretending to be a high schooler and I think even a middle schooler at one point. She attended school and eventually she got caught and that's where we pick up with this case today. And what are the implications of that for the social worker, for the school that she was enrolled in, and why someone would go back and try to revisit high school? So before we dive into the video, please make sure to like and subscribe. That helps our channel to grow and also make sure that you don't miss any of the content that we put out on a regular basis. We've also recently opened up the store for the channel. We've got shirts like this, check it out, super comfortable, great quality stuff, and I'm really excited to share that all with you as we continue to grow this channel. So thank you for your support, let's dive into the video. Prosecutors in Boston say a social worker pretended to be a traumatized teen in the foster care system and managed to enroll in several local schools before she got caught. We're talking with forensic psychiatrist Dr. Daniel Bober about what on earth is going on here. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime, I'm Jesse Weber. One thing to know is that right now we don't know what the motive is for her doing this, but there's something crazy about a 32 year old being able to pass as a high schooler in multiple schools and being able to pull that off for a while. I, I don't think I can pull off being a high schooler anymore. This is a uh, new one to say the least. Prosecutors in Boston, they are laying out a damning and bizarre case against 32-year-old former social worker Shelby Hewitt after they say she went to extreme lengths to pose as a teenager and attend local schools. You heard me right. Yeah. In court this week, she pleaded not guilty to nine charges related to forgery and fraud. You see, while Hewitt was pretending to be a ninth grader and later a seventh grader, court documents say she had in fact had already attended college and graduate school and worked for the Department of Children and Families. She resigned back in February of this year. Hey, I know there are some people who just can't get enough of school, but if you have your pick of schools to go to, I'd say you go back to college, not back to ninth grade and seventh grade. Those are not fun times for most people. Let's keep watching. Let's see what her motives might have been for this bizarre situation. But according to prosecutors, the scheme started two years ago and Hewitt allegedly pretended to be a child in need in DCF custody, but at the same time, she kept on collecting her state salary of $54,000 a year. Now you might be asking, how did she allegedly do this, right? Well, prosecutors say that she had to forge all sorts of documents to keep this elaborate scam going. She allegedly created her own website domain to send emails from email addresses that looked very similar to the official DCF email address. She then pretended to be two different DCF workers. Michael Kornetsky and Michelle Delphi, and she did that to get herself enrolled in both a behavioral treatment center and Boston Public Schools. So she enrolled herself in a behavioral treatment center, I assume for teenagers, and then in the public school system. And again, this is a situation where someone with training in mental health someone who has gone through what I assume is the licensing process up in Massachusetts, using the knowledge and training that she has for some purpose that is not what it was designed to provide. Now, we don't know whether it was a nefarious purpose like we've seen with other social workers and counselors who have had sexual relationships with their students and with clients and things like that. But for sure, this was still an abuse of the privilege and the power that she had, knowing the system, knowing how to enroll herself, even though she was clearly not part of the age bracket that those programs were designed for. In fact, to get herself into the Walden Behavioral Treatment Center, she allegedly impersonated as a real child who was in state custody, stole this person's identity. Now, according to the statement of facts, she allegedly Okay, that's another huge problem. She has access to protected health information, PHI, which we refer to as things like names, addresses, personal contact information, things like that, that always are protected to protect someone's confidentiality. And because she was a social worker, she would have had access to that information for certain kids, and then she was able to abuse that in order to steal this person's identity and enroll them well, herself posing as that person into this behavioral treatment center. That's definitely a problem. And no mental health professional, no medical professional should be using anybody's PHI in that way. Actually enrolled as a 16 year old student at Jeremiah E. Burke High School in the fall of 2022, where she actually joined the girls basketball team. 
I love basketball. I don't need to play that badly. That's pretty crazy though, that she was around coaches, teammates, classmates, teachers, and nobody picked up on the fact that they had a 30 year old in their classroom. No, she apparently chose the number 32 for her jersey, her age, remember? Then she requested a transfer to Brighton High School. In June of 2023, she allegedly enrolled under a different name at English High School in Jamaica Plain, this time posing as a 13 year old. This intricate but false narrative of being an extremely traumatized child with significant special educational needs and emotional needs. So Hewitt is charged with various crimes, including document forgery and identity theft. Her lawyer has said that Hewitt has a long documented history of mental health issues and is getting treatment. Okay, so the lawyer is saying that she has her own mental health issues that I guess contributed to her putting on this elaborate scam. I don't know what specific diagnosis would lead to something like this. And one thing I'm also curious about is how was she able to keep collecting her paychecks if she was going to school every day? Like, if she had a full-time job as a state social worker, how was she also able to attend school? It, that kind of blows my mind that she was able to do that. The other piece too is that obviously having some kind of mental illness or a mental health challenge does not preclude anybody from becoming a mental health professional. But we have to be very careful through the supervision and the training process that those aren't things that are going to interfere with our ability to be the best counselor, or social worker, or whatever that we might be. And so whether she was supposed to be on medication and wasn't taking it, or was supposed to be participating in treatment that she wasn't getting, and, and no, I don't think enrolling in the Behavioral Health Treatment Center was an option for her, there's definitely something about her own mental health challenges that may have been contributing to her abusing the position of trust that she was given. I can certainly understand the outrage the parents would feel. I certainly would feel the same as a parent if my child was in a school that wasn't being properly supervised. Oh, did you hear that? That was slick when he said, I'd be upset if I were a parent at a school that was not properly supervised. So basically he's saying it's the school's fault that she was able to infiltrate their system, that she wasn't caught, and it wasn't her fault at all. She was somewhere where she was not supposed to be as a student. By the way, how was she found out? I know you're probably wondering that. Well, it turns out that an administrator saw all these problems in her registration paperwork after someone posing as her father tried to get her transferred out of English high school. Again, someone posing as her father. So she had someone else in on this scam. I wonder what their role was, whether they were just someone that she paid off or hired. I don't know, but this is starting to turn into some kind of conspiracy. And reportedly, not only that, students started seeing there were discrepancies in her story. They even found her yearbook photo from when she actually attended Sharon High School. For now, Shelby Hewitt is out on $5,000 bail and her trial is scheduled for September of next year. One thing I know from working with teenagers a lot of times I'll feel like they're oblivious in some ways, but if it comes to snooping something out about somebody online, like you don't go to the CIA or the FBI for that, you get some teenagers on it and wow, they found her old high school yearbook. That's crazy. She was required to stay away from social work, any schools, and anyone under the age of 18. Let me bring in right now forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Daniel Bober. Doctor, great to have you here. Great My here. gosh. Uh, Whoa, what is this guy's background? Hey, comment below if you know what his background is from. That looks pretty sweet, but it's a very distracting background to have. It, you know what I'm going to ask you? If she really did do this, why? Well, she certainly exposed cracks within the system. Um, and I actually think um, it was pretty ingenious on her part to be able to do this and to pull this off. But, you know, when I see this case, it reminds me of actually two different movies. It reminds me of the movie Never Been Kissed with Drew Barrymore, where she's an undercover reporter and she goes back to high school. And yeah. also the movie 21 Jump Street. Oh, man. Well, I'm glad this psychiatrist can appreciate a well-executed crime. What's funny is that 21 Jump Street is actually about cops posing as high schoolers to break up a crime ring. But I digress. And, 20, and, 20, and 22 Jump Street, just to be clear. But yeah, uh, uh. Right, tw sorry, 22 Jump Street, or maybe 32 Jump Street. It was 21, but, 22, they'll probably make a 23rd, but yeah. Exactly, exactly. But the point is, is that they go back to high school and besides the plot of what they're trying to accomplish in the movie, 
they find out that high school was not all that a pleasant experience. And so you see all this trauma that they experienced in high school that bubbles up to the surface and they become very triggered by it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you had your pick of different periods of time to go back to, why would you pick high school or especially when she posed as a seventh grader middle school? Like, I have not found anyone who enjoyed middle school yet. There are definitely some questions there just from a... Uh, if you could pull this off, why would you choose these periods of time in somebody's life? So perhaps this individual is someone who either had a very, very nasty high school experience and went back to try to do it right the second time or what Sigmund mm. Freud called repetition compulsion. I was going to say that theory sounds pretty Freudian about how there are unresolved tensions in your past. And usually I think Freud was more focused on like infancy and childhood but i guess we could extend that to like the middle and high school period there are unresolved conflicts or tensions and this is her trying to play those out again and resolve them in a satisfactory manner which is going back to a previous trauma to try to achieve mastery over it or maybe the opposite is true maybe she had a wonderful high school experience and those were the greatest years of her life and because she's so miserable now and so depressed she wanted to relive that I guess the lawyer did say that she had some significant mental health challenges. I don't know exactly what the nature of those are. I don't think that's been released as information yet. Her existence right now would have to be pretty bad to go through all of these steps in order to relive her glory days in high school, if that's actually what the case is. So interesting. The reason we're saying this is no motive has been laid out. Um, I, I was curious if it had something to do with her past high school experience. <laughs> Could it also be, and I am no forensic psychiatrist, that's what we call you for, could it be it was a simpler time in life? If you, if you go back to that, you know, you had your school classes, you had friends, there was, I mean, obviously she's still an adult, she's got to pay her bills, she's got, you know, rent, but the point is, is like, is it going back to that simpler time in life? Maybe not even just what happened to her in high school, but like a simpler time of existence when you're a young child. Well, I think all of us feel, or a lot of us feel, that when we were younger, it was a simpler time. And yes, it was a simpler time because we had less responsibility. And now we're adults and we have jobs and we have bills to pay and we have adult relationships to negotiate. I can't imagine how this fake existence would have been simpler, keeping up with all of her stories that the students were already saying were inconsistent, doing all this fake paperwork, pretending to be multiple different people having someone else come in to pretend to be your father. And then on top of that, like they said, she still has bills to pay. She still has rent to pay. And she had to be getting money from somewhere. So I assume she was still working in some capacity. I don't know how that functions as an escape for her. But I think they are bringing up a good point. If we talk about kind of behaviorally, any behavior that gets repeated, like what was clearly happening in this case, means that there's some kind of reward in it for the actor. And we see this in addiction, even though it doesn't seem very logical, if the person who is addicted did not gain some kind of felt benefit from that behavior, they would stop using whatever drug or doing whatever behavior they're addicted to. And so some of the challenge and some of the change in counseling comes from being able to identify, at least in a behavioral standpoint, what is rewarding about this behavior. And that's not necessarily going to help her legally, but in terms of her being able to get the help that she needs along the line, this might be something that would be really helpful for her and her therapist or her journaling or reflecting to be able to figure out for herself, what am I getting out of this? And what's a more healthy way that I can meet that same need. Maybe it's companionship, maybe it's relationship and community. Regardless, I don't know what's going on in her mind. That's my theory, that there's gotta be something there that she was getting out of it. And if she's able to figure out what that is, there might be an avenue to a healthier way to achieving that. Uh, but this could just also be someone who is severely mentally ill, because if you think about why she did this, there is no obvious motive. In other words, it's not. there's no secondary gain. She didn't do it for money. Uh, and she went through a lot of trouble to forge these documents and to expose these cracks in the system. And you have to wonder what gratification is she getting from this? Did she just enjoy the thrill of being able to negotiate her way through the system and fly under the radar? Was that it? I think there's something deeper going on here, and it probably has to do with her previous trauma. But obviously, she's very troubled. Uh, but clearly, she knew what she was doing here because there were attempts to obviously fool the system to conceal her crime. 
Uh, but again, it's one of those things where uh, the more complicated you make it, it becomes more believable. But ironically, it also becomes easier to expose. So I think that's what's happening here. Now, I, I, as far as I saw in my research, you might have seen something different. Although her attorney says that she's had this history of mental health challenges, was it specific what those challenges were, what she was diagnosed with? Or or if not, if you didn't see it and I didn't see it, um, based on this alleged behavior, what do you think she could be suffering from? It could be everything from a personality disorder to something like a psychosis or literally a departure from reality. So we're talking about something like schizophrenia, perhaps something that's substance induced um, or a personality disorder like borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder. I know he's the expert in this field. I don't know if I'm with him on some of these. Personality disorder by definition are pervasive across our lives. And for her to be 32 and this suddenly becomes a huge issue, that doesn't strike me as a normal pattern of a personality disorder, unless, unless there was some kind of event that maybe exacerbated that seriously recently. In terms of a break with reality, obviously I would need a lot more details about the case. But I would think also she knew that she had to cover her tracks. She was making up documents, making up email addresses and email domains, things like that. It wasn't like she just showed up to the school thinking she was a high schooler. She knew she was playing a part and she was acting. So unless that was part of a delusion or a psychosis where she had to go undercover or she had to pretend to be a high school student, again, that would be determined by, I guess, a psychologist who's evaluating her throughout this case. It's very wide open. Like I said, there's not one particular diagnosis that makes you dress up like a high schooler and enroll yourself in a local school. Someone who has trouble with negotiating relationships, has a fear of abandonment, who, you know, goes the whole spectrum of either idealizing people or devaluing them, who has very unstable emotions. Somehow, some way, this has meaning to her. Somehow she got gratification or got something for this. Otherwise, she wouldn't have gone through the trouble of doing it. So it clearly does something for her. We just don't know exactly what that is. That's exactly what I was talking about earlier. It does take a lot more deep clinical conversation for someone to be able to understand that as an outsider looking in, but hopefully she's able to figure that out for herself and be able to do something different in the future, do something healthier for herself. By the way, I, I want to make it clear there's another possibility too. Could it be a being around young children? I hate to say it, but I also thought about that as well. And, and to be clear, there is harm to other students, well, not other, she's not a student. There is harm to the students of her being there. So, uh, right, I mean, if we could talk about those two points, maybe the aspect of being near minors, but also the aspect of the harm to the students. I think that's possible, especially with a lot of the videos that we've already reacted to, just the way things seem to be in our world today. We have to worry about the sexual abuse, or just the contact and illicit relationships that she could have had with these underage students. Maybe not necessarily in a sexual way, but maybe she enjoys the power differential. Maybe she enjoys knowing everything that she knows and pulling the strings and pulling the wool over their eyes. And maybe she enjoys that power in some way. I, I read uh, one account that she, they thought she was very smart. You know, she knew the homework, she knew what to do. Do you think that is a going into that, that power dynamic? Maybe the fact that she, so I mean, she was so advanced. So 32. I don't know that she was advanced, but what she did was something that probably any worker who's a state worker who knows the system would do. So she knows all the cracks in the system. She knows all the places that she can slip in. And she's a trained social worker. So she's been trained in mental health. She knows the types of patients that would pre present in this situation. And she knew that being a foster child would get her instantaneous admission because it's federal law. So I think this is just someone who maybe wasn't necessarily a, a, an evil genius, if you will, but it was someone who had the training and had the knowledge and experience to get what she wanted and doing it uh, in, a, in a nefarious and a surreptitious way. And that's what I'm saying is that like, for all of us therapists and counselors who think we're on like the bottom rung of medical professionals and things like that, regardless of where we think we stand, we are given a place of power and privilege in this society by virtue of our training and by virtue of the licensure that we obtain. And so we need to take that seriously. 
because as we see in this case, as we see in multiple other cases, if we wanted to take advantage of some of the loopholes that are just inherent to any system, then we actually have an avenue to do that. And it's on us to act ethically and act in the right way to make sure that we are not harming the public. But but to be clear, this is harmful to their classmates, right? They said that they were shocked, disturbed to find out what happened. You know, I don't know because we don't know what she told them. Mm. We don't know how close she got to them. Uh, clearly, um, it's not going to um, boost their faith in humanity in any way. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I've heard um, back when I was in college, there was someone who was in high school who faked their transcripts and got into Yale. And they were in Yale for a year with a B average. I remember his name, too. And the way he got caught was he was started telling people that he was on a minor league baseball team and they started looking him up and the whole story fell apart. And it was kind of funny because here's this guy that had no qualifications to get into Yale, but was doing it for a year with a B average. So mm -hmm. uh, that also sort of uh, brought the whole uh, mystique of the Ivy League into focus. But but I think but the point is, yes, I mean, I think for the other students that she came into contact with, again, this was not over uh, video. This was in person. I do think it was harmful to them. Yeah. Especially at a young age, right? You're dealing with trust issues as is. Um, you, you talked about, here's something that I find interesting. Um, when we talk about mental health, we always have that conversation about the person really understand what they were doing. This was an elaborate scheme, impersonation, forgery. So as much as this could have been motivated and caused by mental illness, there was a conscious effort. There was a conscious understanding that what she was doing was illegal, right? Yes, that's that's really what it comes down to, knowing the difference between right and wrong. And even if she was mentally ill, even if, you know, she was out of touch with reality, there shows on her part a very methodical effort to conceal her identity, to forge these documents. Um, it requires a lot of planning, a lot of forethought to get this done. This was not something that she did where she didn't know what she was doing, in my opinion. I have to ask you about the defense, um, because you would wonder what they would say and their defense attorney. And obviously, it's still kind of in the early stages. But the defense attorney said, quote, obviously, uh, Miss Hewitt is a young lady who's got significant mental health challenges. That's abundantly clear. What's not abundantly clear is how whatever happened was allowed to happen at the Boston public school system for as long as it was. I find that to be a very interesting statement from a defense attorney, almost acknowledging what your client did. Um, but putting the blame on the school system, which I think is fair, um, because the question I always had is, how were they able to be fooled uh, for so long? Did they not know that she was older than she said? So two parts there, what you think about what the defense said. And number two, how do you think so many people were fooled? I think that's a good defense attorney. I think basically he's taking the burden off her and putting it onto the school system, which I think is something a good attorney would do if they're zealously representing you. As far as people not knowing and as far as how she was able to pull it off, I think it's one of those things where the system is not really designed for someone like this, for someone who knows all the ins and outs and all the intricacies, and they're able to fool. And we talked about this in other videos too, where supervision and the accountability of the licensure system is meant to be able to corral well-meaning but maybe inexperienced or incompetent practitioners who make mistakes. Someone who is going to be intentional about evading the system, who knows what they are trying to do and knows that they need to hide it, that's a lot harder for supervisors, for licensing boards to be able to pick up on because you know to try to hide those things. Now, eventually they might overreach just like happened in this case or with um, the case of the Yale student that this guy was talking about. Sometimes what made them successful in the first place will also cause them to overreach and be their downfall. But we can't count on that too. And depending on what her motives were in the first place, we can't count on there not being some more tangible harm to some of the students, whether she was having an inappropriate romantic relationship with some of them or whatever else it could have been the system because it's not you know it's not fort knox it's not a bank um it's a school system so there probably are not safeguards in place that are to the level or to the extreme 
uh, that a motivated person could not be deterred or stopped. By the way, I mentioned that she may have had help. There was somebody posing as her father trying to get her transferred. That's one of the allegations I read. If someone was aiding her in this, now I'm starting to also wonder if it's not just some sort of mental disease, this kind of fascination with being back in school, but if it could be something else, um, some benefit about trying to get in school. I don't know. I mean, yeah, what, do you, what do you make of that aspect? Well, then, you know, if he was conspiring with her, I mean, I think actually he's probably uh, in some ways more culpable than she is, because now if he has no history of mental illness and he's just going along with it, and he's encouraging it and he's complicit in it. That's someone to me uh, that's at least as culpable, if not more, if she if he was aiding her in this. And just to focus again, what you said, uh, the idea that she posed as somebody as a child in need, um, that was also different. Right, that I, I may not just be a way to get into the school easier, but also where she wanted to apply this behavioral treatment center, uh, but also the idea that she came from a troubled place. Is that someone who is looking to be a victim? So I was reading that because she was a foster child and a child in need, that there was some aspect of federal law that would cause her to be admitted quickly than someone else that was just applying off the street. So maybe she did that to get in right. quicker. But, you know, again, she had to know at some level that she was going to be exposed. There were just too many, uh, you know, details that were going on here. And any one of them could have collapsed that would have exposed the whole thing. So, again, if I'm her attorney, I'm saying, well, clearly she knew at some point she was going to get caught because the story was so complicated. You know, that, that old saying, the more complicated the plumbing, the easier it is to stuff it up. All right. Like I said. Crazy story. I don't really know what to make of it, except again that this is the reason why we as mental health professionals, we need to take ethics seriously. We need to take self-care seriously. If she really did have some kind of mental health challenge that, had, that she had a long history with and was documented, then she needed to be getting treatment. She needed to be taking care of herself. If there was some stressor that maybe exacerbated her condition, or maybe cause this whole thing to start blowing up, then that was something that we as mental health professionals, we need to be very aware of as we are practicing. Like he talked about with her being in that victim mentality of labeling herself as a foster child, maybe there was something to that. Maybe she was tired of providing care to others and wanted herself to be the victim for once and allow other people to care for her. I don't know and I can't dive into her mindset because I've never had a conversation with her. But this isn't about just throwing wild theories around of it could be this diagnosis or it could have been this reasoning or this motivation. But this is about why it's important for counselors and social workers to have a strong ethical identity and a professional identity and for us to be able to take care of ourselves, whether that's in managing a long-term mental health issue acute stressors or just being able to make sure that we're practicing professionally and using the trust that we have been given and have earned in a positive and helpful way not in a way that can hurt others so everyone thank you so much for checking out this video like i said crazy story but it was really fascinating to be able to watch and hear about so thank you for tuning in Please like and subscribe. Again, that helps the channel to grow and make sure that you'll be able to tune into all of our upcoming updates. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all next time.